Well, thanks a great deal. Uh, I really appreciate whoever planned this program to put me behind uh, Landon Saunders and uh, my, my friend Randy Harris. I feel like uh, pausing for a moment of uh, silence that would go on for an extended period of time, but I'll press on. Um, I have not been to this campus in a long time, and it's quite different than the last time I was here. It, it's probably five or six times larger than when I was here for real as a student. And so it's been just intriguing to come back and to, to walk around and to see people like you uh, doing their thing at Harding. Uh, I'll tell you, this school shaped my life. And I'm going to talk about our ministry in Dallas some as it relates to very low-income people and homeless people because that's what we've been doing. I had an experience, um, uh, like Randy spoke of a minute ago, uh, I uh, was actually called into Dr. Jerry Jones's office. Anybody know Jerry Jones? Students today probably don't know Jerry, but Jerry Jones uh, was a professor of mine. Uh, he was not the head of the Bible department at the time. I was an uh, American history major, uh, probably headed for law school, uh, had followed my wife, Brenda, wave your hand, Brenda. We've known each other since second grade. I followed her to Harding. I wasn't coming to Harding. I was going to Tulane to play football, but I had an offer to come to Harding to play football, and she was coming to Harding, so I followed her to Harding. And uh, anyway, uh, about midway through my sophomore year, I get a note from Jerry Jones delivered to me saying, Dr. Jones wants to see you ASAP. Now, I didn't have any really wonderful... Uh, rebellious sorts of stories uh, to tell about what I've been doing underground in the church. I was convinced Jones had found out that I was chewing tobacco. Because that's what football players did at the time. And so I went into Jones's office white knuckled with fear that he was going to get me. And he says to me, Larry, you should consider changing your major to Bible. And I didn't know whether to be relieved that he didn't know about the snuff I was dipping <laughs> or to be incredibly stressed out because he thought I ought to enter ministry. But I chose the latter, and I gave up the snuff and started studying Bible, working with Jerry. And I came under the influence of people like that the entire time that I was here. And in some ways, I feel like my education here was kind of a reaction formation. Because some of the things I heard here, especially the sort of socioeconomic political things, didn't seem to quite square with my understanding of the world. And so I can remember, this is heretical, I know, but I got a chance to tell you this great story. I remember one day determining the geographic center of the campus to the best of my ability, and I sat down under a tree near that spot. And in one sitting, I read the Communist Manifesto for myself. And you had to be here at the time to understand that. But Dr. Bales thought there was a communist behind every tree and under every bush in Arkansas. And I couldn't quite figure out why any communist would come to Arkansas. But anyway, I, I, I read Marx, you know, for myself, and I don't think it'd kill me. But it was sort of an integrity kind of thing, right, yeah, while I was here. I fell under the influence of an amazing professor, Jim Howard. And Jim Howard... Uh, led us through the prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets. And, and in that engagement with the text and with his leadership, I came to understand that the God I was trying to discover and know cared deeply and intimately about the poor and the broken. But more than that, it wasn't just compassion and it wasn't just charity. This God cared about equity justice and systems. He wanted to make sure that everyone had a fair shot and that no one was oppressed because of any human factor over which they had no control. He inspired me. He also got in trouble talking about 2nd and 3rd Isaiah, but that's another story. Just dealing with the text from a higher critical standpoint. But that did not in any way affect his ability to, to inspire my heart about what God wanted, expected, 
and can see. As a matter of fact, his interpretation of Isaiah 58, where the prophet lays out the kind of worship that will move God, that crescendos in that great passage where the Lord says through Isaiah, you will call upon me and I will say, here am I. And so the corollary to Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says, here am I, is found in Isaiah 58, where the Lord Jehovah stands from His throne and lifts His hands and says to us as we care for the poor, here am I. Ask whatever you will. I am here for your endeavors. That inspiration came from this campus and it's never left my heart. And I'm very, very grateful for the experience we had here and for this institution. And it's really, it really is good to be back here. By my junior year, Brenda and I were driving north halfway to Pangburn to a little church that was located in the middle of a soybean patch. There was no town. It was the Spring Valley Church of Christ. And we endured some interesting circumstances there. Theologically, the church was very conservative. And we had no ambition to change anything about it because we didn't know what to do. We did know that the church's theology about women was that women couldn't teach anybody, including children. Especially in a room that was mixed with men. And so we were out there a long time on Sundays because we had to have all the children in the one room church house to have Sunday school. And then we had to have the teenagers have Sunday school. And then we had to have all the adults have Sunday school. And then we preached. Uh, my first building campaign was to get that church to build two classrooms on the back of the building so we could at least compress the time we were there on Sundays. But the men taught the five-year-olds. The women didn't teach anybody. Interesting concept. But in the middle of that soybean patch, working with very, very poor Arkansas farmers, we learned what it was to be loved and to love on people. A lot of people were baptized in that little church. And we had a great experience. The highest compliment I've ever been paid came from the elders of that church when I was graduating and going over to Memphis to study with Harold Hazlett. They came to, to me and said, we are prepared to buy a house trailer for you if you'll just stay. And if it hadn't been for Harold Hazlip and already having worked all that out, I don't know, but we might have just stayed there. Because they were so delightful. And uh, we had great times with them. I could tell you a million stories. But somehow, the, the combination and the juxtaposition of inspiration like I got from Jim Howard and Jerry Jones and Neil Pryor and Jimmy Allen, the juxtaposition of that with this very poor Arkansas church sort of shifted my way of thinking about the world. And so we went to Memphis four years after Dr. King was murdered. And that was an incredible time in Memphis, Tennessee. It was a time of great tension and struggle. And we spent a year there studying at the School of Theology. Harold Hazlip led us through a year of the history of Christian thought and Hazlip didn't tell us what anybody thought or wrote. He made us read everything and figure that out for ourselves. And I suppose maybe we learned how to think independently there. And then I had to get a real job because we had a baby coming. And so we moved to Shreveport. Anybody here from Shreveport? We were in Shreveport for two years and 45 minutes. <laughs> Had to be the most racist place I've ever been in my entire life. Our church was set on the, the hinge between one of the poorest neighborhoods in Shreveport and one of the most wealthy neighborhoods in Shreveport. And I didn't know any better. I'm a 23-year-old paragon of wisdom, right? I didn't know any better. I thought the whole role of the evangelist was to get people to come to church. And we had a church that had been in decline, and so I started going out and asking people to come to church including one little boy who lived across the alley behind the church. His name was Wayne Nelson. 
He lived there in a, row, a tenement row with his grandmother. He happened to be African American. I met him one day when he was driving up on his bike. He got off to, to see if he could get a drink of water out of the water fountain on the side of the building, and it hadn't worked for years. Like a lot of things in that church hadn't worked for years, or that water fountain didn't work. And so I came out, I just happened to come out as he was there, and he jumped on his bike and ran off afraid, and I called him back, and we went inside and got a cold drink of water and started a great friendship. Pretty soon, other people like Wayne were coming to that church. And the church actually experienced its greatest attendance when the Orlando Moss family walked in one Sunday to worship with us. Five members in that family put us over 200 for the first time in memory. Dr. Moss composed a symphony piece for LBJ's inauguration. He was a genius musician. musician. He happened to be African American. I had a deacon in that church who was vice president of Louisiana Bank and Trust who called me to his office and said, Larry, you, you mean to tell me that it's just because I don't like black folk, he used a different term, that I might be in jeopardy of going to hell? I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. You need to consider, Jerry, you need to consider the fact that that's more important to God, the way you answer that question than how you feel about instrumental music. And somehow religion's been allowed to seep into our lives to the extent that we we stand strong on things that we can control and that we understand exclusively, but the things that are clear and expansive and about the kingdom of God, we're not ready to handle. And so we hide in church. And we don't get anywhere near the heart of God are the implications and applications of the gospel message in a world that's very real. And so I was gone quickly after that. Matter of fact, that might have been the 45 minutes. We moved to New Orleans, which was an incredible place. Cliff Gaines' church. And we had five years there, New Orleans Baptist Seminary and Tulane University. A great church right in the heart of the city, just three blocks off Canal Street. We actually had two congregations. We had the Sunday group. Most of them were transplants from Texas and Tennessee, working in the Gulf oil patch or working in banking or working in shipping or working in some industry. And so we had Sunday morning church, and it was great. But then we had that Monday to Saturday church. And it was populated with pimps and fortune tellers and prostitutes and drug addicts and homeless people and schizophrenics and very, very poor people. I still remember people like Mr. Adrian and Jane Lowe, both in dire need of the intervention of love and medication and housing. But somehow in that context, I kept going back to what I learned here about what God wanted and what could be achieved if God's people got serious about the city. And then the good Lord's got a sense of humor for sure because He called us back to the church where we'd both grown up. It it had been the Abrams Road Church of Christ by the time we came back, it was Richardson East, and so we came home. And the, the incredible contrast between New Orleans... 1975-1980, and Richardson, Texas, 1980 going forward, was just unsettling. The culture shock was so real. Not unlike what Landon described a while ago after his round-the-world work. We had amazing experiences there. But all of that, as I rehearse it in my mind, even now talking to you, is tied to this place somehow. And the tentacles of strength and insight and an understanding that God is very real and very involved in this world and wants His people to join Him in that kept coming to me again and again and again and again. I'll tell you something. Religion will get you in trouble. A walk with God that's open-hearted and open-handed 
will make your life worthwhile. And the peace that He will provide and the purpose that will be laid before you and, and the sensitivity to His guidance will be something you experience in ways that will allow you to be involved in changing the world, in healing the world, in restoring the rule of God to this realm in which we live. In Luke 7, there's this great story. I, I beg your pardon, Luke 14. Luke 7 is tomorrow. There's this great story of sort of a, a few hours in the life of Jesus. Sort of his background for this, several years ago, there was a, an organization in Richardson. Man, I guess it's been 25 years ago now. It was an organization that worked with low-income people in, in the city. And the director of that program called me and she said, I want you to come and talk to our volunteers about how Jesus did social work. And I said, well, you know, Jesus didn't really do social work. She said, I know, I know, it's... It, that's not what he did, but I want, I want some minister from the city to come and talk to the volunteers at this poverty ministry about what Jesus did and thought and taught about the poor. And I said, okay, I can do that. And so I kind of dug into that idea. Okay, so how did Jesus do social work? What, what did Jesus do? The first thing I realized was Jesus himself was a very poor person. He, he lived here as a poor man. I mean, think about it. He, he was born to poor parents. You can tell that from the sacrifice of dedication. It wasn't a lamb. It was, it was pigeons, turtle doves. It was, the, it was the sacrifice reserved for the poor. I mean, early in his life, he was a political refugee. He was a migrant, that he, uh, on, on one occasion he made the statement that he had no place to lay his head. The animals, the birds and the foxes were better off than he. He was homeless. If you watch how he did his ministry, he was supported by people, largely by women. He had nothing. He borrowed many things. Meeting rooms, Crosses made by others, even a tomb. I mean, Jesus, the incarnate presence of God among us, taking on the flesh, pitching His tent with us here, came as a very poor person. And then the second thing I noticed as I kind of prepared my lesson about Jesus and social work was that, that, that he was an incredible advocate for the poor. And that's where Luke comes in. Because from the Magnificat in chapter 1, all the way to the widow's might, almost at the end of Luke, almost every other chapter has Jesus talking about how the people of God should respond to those who are poor. I mean, Luke has John the Baptist giving a courageous witness about justice and poverty. Chapter 4, there's a mission statement that he comes and makes after the temptations. He comes and, and basically in his own synagogue in Nazareth, he lays out his mission which includes announcing the year of Jubilee and bringing good news to the poor. Because he came to his hometown in the power of the Spirit after those temptations. Chapter 6, it's the Beatitudes, Lucan style. You're not going to spiritualize it. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who mourn. Chapter 7, it's John the Baptist's inquiry as to whether or not Jesus is the one or not. Chapter 9, the feeding of the 5,000. Chapter 10, the Good Samaritan. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. One of those passages is here in Luke 14. The other thing 
The other aspect of my little talk about how Jesus did social work included the fact that Jesus dignified the poor when he dealt with them. He never assumed or approached them in a way that would have made them feel as if he assumed that he knew what was best. On a number of occasions, when he encountered a suffering person, he would say something like, do you want to get well? Or in essence, what do you need? What do you think? He he confronted them about performance. And he encouraged them about God's love. There was never a condescension by the only one who's ever lived who had the right authority, power, and position to condescend. But rather there was this dignity about the engagement. And and so, Luke 14, verse 1. On one occasion when Jesus was going to eat a meal on the Sabbath in the house of a leader of the Pharisees, they were watching him closely, the religious people. Just then in front of him there was a man who had dropsy, and dropsy is congestive heart failure, put in modern terms. Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. And then he said to them, If one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? But they could not reply to this. Watching him to see whether or not he would violate their interpretation of the law watching him from the bastion and protection of a religious system that had to have all the answers, that had to maintain all the control, that that allowed them to overlook the man who was suffering from a terrible physical condition. Religion and religious systems will drive us crazy, make us ineffective, And I believe completely dishonor God and God's intentions. When I first came to Central Dallas Ministries 20 years ago, I bought a coffee pot. I love coffee. Mark's keeping me in coffee this weekend, which is really good. It was one of these grade A you know, upper level quality church fellowship hall coffee pots. It was huge. And I was going to put it in the interview room where people would come in to tell us what they needed as they were taking advantage of our food distribution center or talking to us about housing or whatever it was that they were dealing with. So I'm, I'm making coffee the first day that I have that coffee pot in it. A long-time volunteer comes over and puts her arm around my shoulder and she says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm making coffee. I, I, I figured I like coffee. I bet a lot of our guests who come like coffee will have a good time talking to people, sharing coffee. And she said, don't you know that if you serve coffee, these people will never leave? Now, when I took this job, I readily acknowledged that I didn't know anything about what I was doing. Twenty years later, I still don't. I need an asterisk by my name which says, parenthetically, which directs you to a parenthetical statement at the bottom of the card that would say something like, beware, this man doesn't know what he's doing. Never had a social work class. Never had any training for what I'm doing. But I somehow knew instinctively that it was a good thing to offer hospitality to people who were coming to talk about personal problems that were difficult for them. I told Brenda that night when I came home that I thought we were probably about a half a bubble off plum, that we really didn't understand what was going on and that we probably weren't being very effective in the community because we were just trying to, as efficiently as possible, run people through the grid that we had created and that was manageable for us. And interestingly enough, 
some of those same original volunteers that we had who were so burned out, to Randy's point, they were the ones who were most adamant about us making sure that we taught the gospel to those who came in. There was a woman at that time who every Thursday sat at the welcome desk. A meaner woman I've never met. I have no idea how she got that assignment. One day, Willie Nelson walked in. I swear it looked just like Willie Nelson. Long, gray, braided hair, crevice face. And he leaned over to sign in, as was our process, at the welcome desk. And she spotted a pack of Camel cigarettes in his shirt pocket. And I heard her say, you know, if you wouldn't spend your money on these nasty old cigarettes, you wouldn't have to come in here and take our food out. Probably the person most insistent on witnessing to the faith that she understood it, and yet maintaining that kind of hateful attitude to a man who simply said to her, I'm sorry, ma'am, and sat down. Now, there had been a guy there who really needed to go, and I had fired him. He was on the payroll. We had to get the Sanhedrin together to get rid of this woman. <laughs> but we, got, we, 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 we dismissed her with joy. <laughs> but I was left... I was left with volunteers who were still crispy critters. And just like these Pharisees who can't really engage Jesus as to the answer to his question in light of this man's suffering, these crispy critters didn't really know what to do either. And there was a lot of silence and ineffectiveness. And again, to Randy's point, I think God had mercy on me because we weren't getting anywhere with our religious protectionism and propensity to control everything. And I didn't have enough sense to know what to do. But one day God intervened. I had three Hispanic women arrayed in front of me with their children. I know that's not a good way to do social work, I'm sure, but like I told you, I've never had a social work class. These three women were trying to pull their limited English to overcome my abject stupidity because I can't speak Spanish. I knew they all three needed something. I had no idea what they needed. A woman that I had already interviewed came out of the grocery store area carrying her belongings and her groceries out the front door, and I stopped her. And I said, ma'am, could you please help me? And she said, certainly. What do you need? And I said, I need someone to translate this conversation so we can assist these families. And Josefina Ortiz set her groceries down, and she sat down beside me and with these three women, and she didn't translate anything. She conducted the interview. She'd been there before. She knew the ropes. She was able to help these three families enormously. These three women who had been perfect strangers to begin with began to converse with each other, and they were developing a relationship. And by the time they left and everything was done, they were just... They left with their children enjoying each other and laughing and thanking us. And it was a wonderful, warm, beautiful experience. And of course, I couldn't really absorb all that because I was on my knees thanking Ms. Ortiz for her help. She had the good sense when she got to the door to turn back to me and say, Larry, I could come back tomorrow and help you. And I said, of course, wouldn't that be grand? You can see I need your help. Please do. So she came back tomorrow for nine years, virtually every day. And that afternoon, when I went upstairs to my office, I heard God. And God said to me, Larry, you don't have any idea what this neighborhood needs. And I could look out on the street from the window in my office and I could see people everywhere with time on their hands and fear in their hearts, trying to stay away from the drug dealers or trying to make drug connections. We were surrounded by that kind of culture at that time. They were everywhere. And God says to me, 
You don't know what this neighborhood needs. You can't know. And furthermore, whenever you evaluate it, you only evaluate it in terms of material wealth or the lack thereof. You don't see the social capital. You don't see the wealth that I've buried in that neighborhood. You don't see what's there to be engaged because you're so limited and you're so focused on the material, you can't see the real wealth of the neighborhood. And so, after that moment of revelation, and I was raised in the church not expecting any revelation post-Scripture, right? But that was revelation. The next 45 days, we changed our entire culture. And the last line we put on our little interview form that we put everybody through who came into our center was simply this. Right under, can we pray for you? We put, could you help us? And so we went from having 15 to 20 burned out crispy critter volunteers who were kind of snarky to having 300 volunteers who could never keep the canned corn straight. But I can tell you something about the spirit of your endeavor by looking at your canned corn. <laughs> if it's perfectly straightened up, you got trouble. Because probably the kind of people you really need in there aren't able to get in there. Because we want to control everything. And so we had volunteers running out our ears. And one of the founders of the organization, from, a, from an economic standpoint, told me on one occasion, of course, he thought it was delightful, but he said, you have the lunatics running the asylum. And I said, well, we've got the neighborhood engaged in what we're doing here, and we're not doing anything without hearing from them, because what we got here is a 24-7 think tank, if we want it, if we're smart enough to capture it, right? The thing that I heard most often, it was most discouraging, was these people are going to steal you blind. I think if I heard that one time, I heard it a hundred times. And finally, my answer became, you know what? You're right. I've noticed in this business there's some theft. I've also noticed it's one of two kinds. It's canned corn out the back door to sell on the streets. Or it's human dignity stolen at the front door. I'm going with the canned corn cartel. I'm just going to go with those guys because I know those guys can, they can be reformed. But human dignity stolen at the front door, never again. The human dignity pirates are banned from this center. And it's been cluttered and messy and noisy and real and honest and heartbreaking every moment since then. But it's, it's, it's the conflict between those who want to know what you're going to do on the Sabbath to keep things straight and to keep it under control and those who simply care about the guy who's got congestive heart failure and may die if you don't intervene. Religion will destroy your ministry and your effectiveness and your heart. And it will block you from discovering those things Landon talked about earlier this evening. And we, we have to stand over against it as Jesus did because it's so important. If, as, you, as you read on, he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor. He told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In religion, there's a pecking order. There's a system of power. There's, there's artificial significance that's gained from this whole system that blocks us from being human. And when one of the fierce things is this, is this sense of significance that is conveyed by the group and that 
must be struggled for somehow. It, it, it's, it's easy to see. It, it's hard to avoid unless you can see into your own soul. But it's interesting if you're committed to stepping back, to going to the back row. Because when God shows up in lives, several things begin to happen. People and their pain take priority over religious rules. And positions of honor are no longer important. As a matter of fact, when God shows up, God's people go to the back row, dive to the bottom. And they're their position to simply observe and learn and discern. And, and there's a great comfort in the quietude of being back. There, there's a great perspective from the viewpoint of those bringing up the rear. A great many questions can be answered in the solitude of being behind. A great many observations can be discerned and life can be deepened and made rich by the humility of not pushing forward. And then occasionally, if one is called forward for usefulness, there's power in that as well. But we keep coming back to this notion of control. When humility is the better pathway. And that leads me to the last section of this reading. Verse 12. He said also to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, and the next time you do this, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you should be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. There's a lot in that when you throw a party advice. Don't invite the usual suspects. Invite people who really need a banquet. Do you know how many people need a party? Do you know how many people need the blessing of being invited for a meal? Do you know how many, how many broken, oppressed, crushed people would delight at the kind of banquet we'll enjoy in the next few hours. And that's not to pour, to pour out rain, or that's not to put clouds over anything we experience that's good and uplifting. But rather it is a way of thinking. But I'll tell you something, Jesus didn't tell the whole story here. For while it's true that the people he has in mind could not afford to repay by, by offering a banquet invitation to you or to me, I've found over the past 20 years that the poor share their wealth freely with us. They have become my seminary professors. They have become my counselors about what life is really all about. I have watched again and again and again persons with nothing tear off gladly half of it and give it away. And I've been astounded. Every Thursday that I'm in town, I go to the corner of Dawson and Malcolm X, which is just adjacent to a new opportunity center that we're building. And I go there just to hang out and talk to people because that corner is, a, is an intersection that accommodates a steady stream of people from under the I-45 bridges, if you know Dallas, over to a very popular shelter or over to campgrounds under those bridges. And so we were there with homeless people every week. 
And we don't really have a big feeding program. That's not, that's not why we're there. We're, we're there. we're there just to hang out and talk and, and learn what's going on. And we don't want to invade that neighborhood with a new center without knowing who's there. And there is such wisdom there, such humility there, such pain there. The, the, the result of violence is seen there. The result of deep fellowship is seen there. It's like a crossroads of the world. It's seen at that place. And the insights that we've picked up and that I've learned there rival all those insights we've learned from the volunteers who work in the rest of our organization's work. And the the information that's been fed back to us at that corner is not unlike the information we received in the early days of that food pantry. The poor have a wealth to share. It's really hard to comprehend until you engage it. But if you take it seriously, you encounter God. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, Jesus says. There are a number of passages that talk about treasure in heaven and this kind of repayment. Luke 16, the first nine verses is a great parable about that whole reality. That those who welcome us home to God are going to be the poor we engage or not engage here. I'll close with this little narrative. I'll never forget this. I have a friend on the corner. I'm convinced he's a chronic inebriate. He has a real problem with alcohol. But he's also the sweetest spirit I've ever met. And he's a deep thinker. And he has incredible faith. And he struggles with this alcohol. He lost his wife three years ago to a tragic, sudden illness. And everything went, everything went down. So one day recently, I was there visiting with people, and I noticed that my friend, his nickname is Blue. He always wears blue. He always wears blue clothing. He was sitting on the steps of this old house, and he was reading. And that's not unusual. He reads all the time. So when I finished my conversation with friends over a ways from him, I walked over to greet him, and I said, "Blue, how are you? And what what are you what are you reading?" And he opened the book and held it up like this so I couldn't see the cover. He said, just read, read, that, read that page right there. And I read this great spiritual prose about the blessings and qualities of a, a life given over to meditation. And I looked at the cover. Thomas Merton, Thoughts in Solitude. Here's a brother in pain, broken by the world. A person for whom God (coughs) sent Jesus. A person who now encounters us and needs the healing that we can bring. But I've noticed something about healing relationships. They always have the quality of reciprocity. And everyone receives and everyone gives in that kind of a healing relationship. And that's what we're moving toward with my friend Blue. Because he has so much to offer. We need to throw parties where everybody's honored. Everyone's taken care of. Everyone's healed. And no one has to spend time answering questions that are irrelevant to life's journey. Let's pray. God, for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and your presence, we give you thanks. Bless these students. May you do your great work in their lives that they might touch the world the way that you've touched us.
that you've touched us all. And may we fully comprehend the power of the presence of Jesus Christ in this world and in our lives. May we represent Him well while remaining very open to the way He teaches us in the pain and isolation and difficulty that we experience and that we encounter in others. Thank you, Lord, for this special evening. In Jesus' name, amen.